As a veteran park ranger, there's one missing person case that still messes with me. So in November the 10th of 2014, YouTuber Kenny Beach set off on his last hike. He'd informed some close relatives that he was going on a short overnight trip into the desert near Area 51, but it was one from which he would never return. Yet Kenny was hardly an inexperienced desert hiker or spelunker and had ventured into the arid dry deserts of Nevada many times before. He claimed to have hiked solo across mountaintops that many people would have never dared to attempt and had lost count of the number of caves he had explored. But there was one particular cave that had terrified the veteran explorer and it was during an additional visit to that particular subterranean cavern that he disappeared without a trace. As I've stated, Kenny was no amateur. He had been hiking and caving for 20 plus years, having encountered all sorts of life-threatening dangers on his travels, from sheer cliffs and animal traps to rattlesnakes and freezing conditions. Kenny had faced some of the most terrifying threats the natural world has to offer, but he always made it back. He always got himself out of whatever jam he was in. He might have returned beat up and exhausted from his trips, but only once was he ever forced to call for help in an incident in which he'd hurt his leg on a mountaintop and was forced to call in a helicopter rescue. So it is well documented that he had an excellent safety record and was in no way reckless or foolish. One day, while Kenny was out exploring the desert near Nellis Air Force Base, he came across a cave system with an entrance shaped like a perfect capital. Um, Kenny entered every cave he came across and naturally... He was even more curious about this one given its unusual shape, but on his approach, he found a strange feeling taking over his body, a bizarre, vibrating feeling that shook him to his bones. The closer he got to the cave's entrance, the more intense this feeling became, until it was so strong that he became intensely terrified, fleeing the area without even attempting to explore it. He posted a YouTube video under the username Snakebitemgi, which was titled, Son of an Area 51 Technician. This video detailing the events, telling his viewers that it was far the strangest experience he had ever had whilst out hiking in the desert. And so began one of Nevada's most peculiar and puzzling urban legends. Obviously, the video sparked a huge amount of interest from his subscribers. A multitude of users enthusiastically encouraged Kenny to return to the cave to properly explore it and to properly document its appearance and location as to provide proper evidence of his strange and terrifying discovery. Naturally, he obliged them. On this second trip to the M-shaped cave, Kenny armed himself with a 9M pistol, along with a video camera, so that he might show his subscribers exactly what he'd seen. However, much to the disappointment and skepticism of the YouTube community, Kenny couldn't seem to be able to retrace his step to the cave's location. Some called him out as having lied about what he'd seen, calling him a fraud and a fabricator. However, in the video itself, Kenny is visibly shaken that he can't seem to locate what he'd easily stumbled across during his previous visit. His experience with hiking and navigation meant that he'd have no trouble finding it again if he wished to do so. And we can understand why people might think that made him a liar. But Kenny insisted that it was like his mind was playing tricks on him and rebuked any who accused him of having made the story up. To save face, Kenny vowed to go back out into the desert a third time in order to prove he was not simply lying about the whole thing. This seemed to satisfy the doubters and reassure his regular viewers. Oh, except one. No, do not go back there. If you find that cave entrance, don't go in, you won't get out. Read one user's comment on the video posted. Other commenters asked them exactly what they meant by the plea, imploring them to share what knowledge they had of the cave that would cause them to leave such a stark warning. The user never replied. Even in spite of the warning, Kenny was undeterred. He was determined to prove that he was not a liar, determined to prove that his hiking and navigating skills weren't slipping. At some point, he posted a comment telling his viewers that he was making a third trip into the Mojave, one of the hottest and driest regions of the planet, 
in order to finally relocate the cave and to explore it. He told viewers that although he was not taking his video camera for mobility's sake, he would be making a detailed record of the cave's location so that he and his subscribers could easily find the M cave for themselves for the sake of making their own judgments. Viewers awaited his return with bated breath, thrilled at the prospect of more information on a place that could well be connected with nearby Area 51, or at least have some kind of extraterrestrial or paranormal significance. Since Kenny would be making an overnight trip, they knew they would have to wait until the following day for a new post from their favorite desert explorer. But the day came, and nothing was posted. Then another day went by, and still nothing was posted on Kenny's YouTube channel regarding the M Cave. Eventually, concerned viewers alerted local authorities that Kenny might well be in some danger. And after the mandatory 72-hour period, Kenny Veach was officially listed as a missing person, and the search for him began. On the 22 of November 2014, search and rescue volunteers found Kenny's cell phone lying in the dirt at the entrance to an abandoned mine shaft. This was the same mine shaft featured during the video entitled Am Cave Hike, Kenny's second trip into the desert, in which he filmed himself being unable to locate the cave entrance, much to his own anxious confusion. The search and rescue volunteers superficially explored the bottom of the shaft, but could not find Kenny or his body. Yet there was no other trail leading from the cave that would indicate that Kenny had headed off in any other direction. To the volunteers, it seemed like he had just straight up disappeared, plucked from the face of the earth by some unknown, unseen force. Additional rescue teams were called in from surrounding areas, and on the advice of Kenny's girlfriend and sometime hiking partner, they found his truck in its usual parking spot. But again, Kenny was nowhere to be found, and any trails they found went cold near the abandoned mine shaft. Kenny's sudden disappearance fueled all manner of conspiracy theories which speculated on his fate. Some insisted that Kenny had fallen down the mine shaft, even in spite of the search and rescue team's insistence that there were no corpses to be found down there. Others asserted that Kenny had found a hidden entrance to Ares 51 or had come across some kind of military secret that had led to him being detained by the U.S. military. While more outlandish theories abounded that the I'm Cave was some kind of extraterrestrial structure and that Kenny had either been abducted or killed by visitors from other worlds, it is most likely that Kenny simply fell victim to the elements went a bridge too far in his search for the truth, and had died of dehydration or heat stroke. But if this was the case, there is very little doubt that his body would not be found and recovered by the search and rescue teams, who at one point used a helicopter to scour the area for any signs of him. But a post from Kenny's girlfriend in the months that followed his disappearance might shed a little more light on what became of him. She mentioned that her boyfriend had been battling with depression for many years by that point, and that he may well have gone out into the desert one last time to end his own life. At least that's the only logical explanation she could think of. Yet as much as we can rely on her for an insight into his personality, it ties into our previous point that surely someone somewhere would have found his body. We might never learn the truth of Kenny Veach's fate. But if we can learn anything from his disappearance, it's that it would be extremely unwise to go looking for that shaped cave. I joined the army. Not because I wanted to, but because my father was in the military. And his father before that, and his father before that. So other than it being expected of me, I always just felt that it was the right thing to do. I thought I would be disappointing my family if I didn't also enlist. It was the worst mistake of my life. Other than the severe depression and Pete's D, I experienced something that I cannot forget, no matter how hard I wish I could. At one point I was stationed at Fort Dietrich in Maryland. The details of how I wound up there aren't important, but I was there for much longer than I would have liked. The thing about the military is that you surrender all control to someone else. So no matter how much I wanted to leave that place, it really wasn't up to me. Something you need to know about Fort Dietrich is that back in the day, 
In the 1940s, shortly after the Pearl Harbor attack, the base was used to experiment with some pretty intense and bizarre biological weapon. It's a fact that most don't like to talk about, and it isn't mentioned all that often while on base. But it's there. There have always been rumors of some toxin or another accidentally being released into the air. But I always just played that off as childish scary stories or twisted rumors. That is, until one night, I saw something that I can't unsee. In fact, I see it every time I close my eyes. I was going for a walk late one night when I couldn't sleep. It was a crisp and quiet night, and I was really enjoying the walk. It seemed as if the entire world had come to a standstill. Nothing seemed to be moving. Everyone seemed to have been asleep. It felt as if I was the only person in the entire world. All I could hear was the cool breeze and the sound of my own feet as I walked. I still remember wishing that I could freeze that moment and enjoy the peace for the rest of my life. At the time, I wasn't very happy. I hated being in the military and I felt very lonely and isolated. As I was walking, I couldn't shake the feeling that I was being watched. It sort of came out of nowhere. I was enjoying the silence and the peace and boom. It felt like there were a million eyes on me. I kind of stopped and peered around to see if I could see anyone else. I couldn't see anything, so I carried on walking. Then I felt it again, like eyes on me watching my every move. So I stopped walking. I looked around again, this time more carefully. I just couldn't shake the feeling. Then from behind the wall of another building, I saw something peering its head out at me. As it saw me spotting it, it ducked back behind the wall. It seemed unusual, like the behavior of a child, but much, much larger than a child. I took a few steps closer and called out to it, thinking it was just another person behaving strangely. I figured maybe they were smoking something or drinking when they weren't supposed to be. I walked around to where I had seen the thing, and there was nothing. I stood there for a while and wondered if maybe I had imagined the entire thing. Then I saw that the dirt had been disturbed where I was standing, so I knew I wasn't imagining it. At that point, I still thought it was a person, so I walked around the building to see if I could find them. I found nothing. I waited a moment to see if they'd come back, but then I heard a loud bang from the roof of the building. It startled me completely, and I stumbled backward a little bit. I landed on my butt and immediately looked up. On the roof was a massive skeletal creature. It looked like nothing but skin and bones, although it didn't look like a human at all. It seemed like there was something human about it. It frowned at me as if to figure out what it should do next. I was so afraid, I couldn't get a word out and I could hardly breathe. Before I could catch my breath, it scampered over the roof. It jumped from building to building almost too fast for me to keep track of. I saw it as it disappeared super fast. I sat on the ground for a moment afterward to make sure I wasn't dreaming. I don't know what I saw, but I know that I had a really hard time sleeping until I finally left that base. To this day, I can't help but wonder if what I saw was the result of some leaked biological toxin from the 40s or something like that. To start things off, I'm not from the U.S. I live in Eastern Europe and I'm surrounded by mountains and woods from every side. It's basically a valley. I had a very odd encounter that made me read into our folklore. And the only thing that closely resembles the described entities are skinwalkers. And I'm here to ask for help from people that have more experience or knowledge on them. A month or so ago, late at night, I started hearing growling or something along the lines of a big dog loudly snoring. I didn't really pay it any mind because I was on the phone talking to my boyfriend. Turned everything off so he can hear it as well. We both just assumed some dog snuck in my garden. Same thing happened a few more times over the span of the upcoming three weeks. This Monday I was out in my backyard having some wine at around midnight, and music was playing when I heard something like a dog or a cat running across leaves. I turned the music off and it happened again. To be honest, I was going to go up to check it out, but my boyfriend texted me not to, and to use flash, look around. 
I did that, and near the walnut trees I have in the distance, I saw something resembling a human. But I wasn't sure what I'm seeing, because my eyesight is not the greatest, and I wear glasses. So I decided to look through my phone, and as I was zooming in, my heart dropped, because it definitely looked like a deformed human. I snapped a pick and bolted back inside. That was three nights ago, and every single night since then I feel like I'm sleeping half awake with the exception of last night, where I had a very vivid dream of a close friend of mine, acting unusual and having piercing green eyes. They're brown. Can anyone help with explaining how to get rid of entities resembling skinwalkers, if it even is that? I'm not easy to believe stuff like this, but it made me really paranoid, especially at night. I'm much older now, but when I was a young man in the 1960s, I was stationed at Mount Weather in Virginia. Up until the mid-70s, the base of Mount Weather wasn't very well known. I was chosen to be there because I had no near family. Actually, I had no family at all. I'd been an orphan, and so I had no next of kin or parents of any kind. I think that's largely why I was picked for what happened next. One day I was going about my usual daily business when I was told that I needed to attend an urgent and unplanned meeting. I followed the gentleman across the entire base, all the way to the other side. When I got to the meeting room, there were a bunch of generals that I didn't recognize at all. They were smiling as if they were excited to see me. They welcomed me in and offered me tea and coffee. The usual. From the get-go I felt uncomfortable about it all. They sat me down and told me that they had an assignment for me. I needed to stand in for a guard. That was a way for his help. Seemed like kind of an odd meeting to have just to ask me to do such a simple task. I agreed, but they didn't seem too pleased yet. Then they explained to me that the guard I was replacing was stationed in one of the newer underground bunkers that had been built. I had known about them building it. I just didn't know anything about what their purpose was. That day, I learned that they had holding cells down there, and that everything that happened in the bunker was top secret. Immediately, it made my hair stand on end. Nothing about it sounded right, but I had already agreed to take the job, and I'm a man of my word. They wasted no time in taking me down there. The bunker was well-lit and state-of-the-art for that era. They marched me fast through the halls. I barely had time to look at anything. At one point I asked them to slow down so that I could remember how to get back when my shift was over. They informed me that when my shift was done, someone would come and get me. Again, I didn't like the way any of this was sounding, but I was already there and I had already signed the paperwork. They put me outside this one room and instructed me to keep guard. They told me that inside was a dangerous prisoner and that should something happen to pull the alarm that was on the wall to my left. I agreed, and they were on their way. Nothing about it seemed normal to me. But in those days, we trusted everyone that was in the military without question, so I did just that. It was a pretty uneventful night, and when my shift was over, someone came to fetch me and told me to be ready for them at the same time the following night. Again, I did as I was told, and the next night, they took me back to the cell that I needed to guard. This went on for four nights. On the fifth night, I was starting to get really bored of the job. Nothing happened. I had no idea who was in the cell, and I had no desire to look. There was a small window that could be opened up here inside, but I was under strict instruction not to do so. That night, though, something finally happened within the cell. Suddenly, out of nowhere, I heard a shrieking sound. It was loud enough to pierce right through the thick walls of the cell. The shriek was followed by intense banging. It sounded like something was being thrown from one side of the cell to the other. I could hear it bounce from one side of the cell to the other and off the roof of the cell even. It was insane. I waited a few minutes and it died down. With a sigh of relief, I carried on with my duty of standing guard. Then it happened again. But this time it was banging against the door of the cell, still shrieking loudly. It took me a moment but I realized that the banging sound wasn't followed by the sound of something falling. This means whoever it was, they weren't throwing an item. They were throwing themselves around that room. It reminded me of a crazed animal that had been trapped against its will, 
I couldn't imagine who would have enough strength to throw themselves with that much force. So my curiosity got the better of me, and I opened the little window. I really wish I hadn't. What I saw was a creature so large. It filled almost the entire cell. It had completely white eyes and a wide snarl. Drool dripped from its open mouth as it shrieked again, rattling the small window. Not a single hair was on its body, and I could see the bones of its ribs and spine. It was clear that it hadn't eaten in a while. I slammed the window shut and hoped it would quiet down so that I didn't need to ring the alarm. Thankfully, that's exactly what happened. I've spent my entire life keeping this story to myself. In those days, we obeyed the rules without question, and so that's what I've done. They told me never to say anything, so I haven't. I figured that now all the men who I'd been in agreement with are likely dead. So I might be off the hook. I don't know what I saw, and I wish I hadn't seen it. Perhaps someone out there has the answers for me. One thing I can tell you, though, is that if something doesn't feel right, it's likely because it isn't. I spent a small part of my military career at the Harvey Point Defense Testing Facility in North Carolina. Most people know that the base is completely shrouded in sea of mystery. The rumors and conspiracy theories about Harvey Point run strong and plenty. The facility is hidden away behind large fences and large trees. It's a fascinating place with a fascinating history. But I do hope that I never set foot there again. It's a fairly large facility and most of the people there like to make friends, as is normal amongst humans. While I was there, I heard many people talking about an animal of some kind that would appear occasionally at night and scare one of the personnel. I was always one of the people who was just too busy to stop and chat, so I never really joined in the conversations. I always just heard it in passing. From what I could gather, though, the animal was terrifying. It had scared some personnel so badly that they needed counseling. I just figured it was a large dog or a bear or something. Anyway, it seemed to be a rather hushed topic of discussion. I had heard many people talk about other people having seen it, but I had never heard anyone actually say that they had seen it. So I brushed it off most of the time. I had never really thought anything of it. I was always too busy to pay attention and I didn't care much for spooky campfire stories. That is, until I discovered that it was nothing at all like a spooky campfire story. I was walking through the base one night taking some paperwork with me. For the life of me, I can't remember exactly where I was going. But I know that I was walking with determination. I had my head down and I was looking at the papers when I walked directly into something. I remember noticing at first that it felt like human skin as if I had walked into someone who was completely naked. Only this thing was completely cold. Keep in mind, all of this happened within a matter of seconds. I looked up and staring at me, is what looked similar to what I imagine a shaved bear looks like. Only the skin was pale and it was about three times the size of a large bear. It was scrawny and it breathed heavily. I was completely frozen in place. I didn't know what to do. Should I run? Should I call for help? I knew for sure that attacking wasn't an option. The large claws on that creature told me that it could kill me with one hit. So I just stared, unable to breathe from fear. The creature just huffed and scampered off into the darkness, leaving me there in a state of pure panic. The sweat was running down my back when I finally caught my breath. But with every second that I stood outside, I felt more and more unsafe. So I turned and went back to bed forgetting all about the paperwork in my hands. That night I didn't sleep at all. I just thought about whether or not I should tell someone what I had seen. But then I remembered the way that other people spoke about those who had come into contact with the creature and all of it had been negative. Those people had been called weak, crazy, unstable, unable to serve, I didn't want that for myself, so I decided that I would just rather keep quiet and never walk through the base at night again. The thing that scared me most about it was that I found myself constantly wondering how it got inside the facility. Or 
if it was rather trapped in there with no way out. My experience happened in late June 2019. The location was Governor Dick Park, which is located in southern Lebanon County. I live in a town called Littitz, which is only about a 25-minute drive away in neighboring Lancaster County. It is a major residential hub for those folks who work and commute in Philadelphia. It is only a little over an hour's drive away from here. The girl I was dating at the time wanted to go for a hike at the park. It was a Saturday morning, so we went. It was quite hot out, easily into the 90s, however. We made our way up the main trail toward the top of a couple of trails. Some are for foot traffic, and others are for horses. There's another trail that is for mountain bikes. As we hike up toward the top of the hill, Mount Gretna, there's a decent-sized tree that was bent over the trail and wedged into another tree on the opposite side. There were several folks gathered there in awe of it. I had been interested in Bigfoot for some time and knew about tree bends. This wasn't caused by the weight of the snow. The bark, right where it was bent, was twisted off and the branches of it were wedged into the branches of the trees on the opposite side of the trail. I wasn't at the peak of the hill and the tree wasn't facing the prevailing winds in the area. We continued to hike to the top of the mountain. We reached the tall watchtower and climbed the steps to the top. Now, I have pets from an event that I won't get into here, so I want to describe how climbing the top of this involves climbing short ladders that are enclosed in a concrete tunnel. When you get to the top, you have to step off to the side and grab the next ladder climb. These are tight quarters with an escape out. The intense heat could trigger uneasy feelings. We reached the top. I took in the beautiful view, but quickly and then we descended back down to ground level. When we got to the bottom, there was an open area away from the structure which opened up to the top of the hollow, so I walked over there with her to get a breather and have a cigarette. Just as I approached the crest of the ridge, where I could look down to the hollow, I heard what sounded like a very large man let out a guttural raw groan. I have enough time in the woods to be able to gauge sounds. The issue was a man sounded that loud from that distance, as if he were only five yards from me. The entire area is choked with mountain laurels and briars, so no human would have been there. I didn't say a word to my girlfriend, and she didn't say a word to me about the sound. I only said, come on, let's go get some lunch. We headed back down the main trail. I've never felt more naked and vulnerable. She talked about some mundane stuff which I occasionally responded to. I wasn't really listening to her and was only focused on the hollow on her right from where that sound came. When we hit the last stretch of the trail, where it sort of bottomed out and became flat again, I happened to look down and saw a stack of large, smooth rocks stacked neatly on the top edge of the trail. These rocks weren't there when we walked up and they weren't native to that area. Rocks that you find on the typical forest trail have edges, but these rocks were completely smooth and looked like they came from a creek. I recognized the stacked rocks as a recognition of me heeding the beast's verbal warnings. We reached our lunch destination. When I brought up the sounds, my girlfriend admitted hearing what I heard but had no idea what it was. I filled her in on my thoughts of the incident, and needless to say, she was skeptical but in an uneasy way. Now to start everything off, I live in northern Quebec, and I've lived there for about 17 years now. My grandfather used to take me hunting out in woods when I was 10. He told me one of his stories when I was younger about a wendigo that was possibly hunting in the woods. He had told me that livestock have mysteriously gone missing. The animals have been eaten or just taken is what his thoughts were. But his thoughts were cancelled out when he seen this giant deer one day. This deer, he said, was the biggest deer he's ever seen, as in his entire life could have easily weighted, at least weighted at least 400 pounds. So as he picked up his gun when he saw the deer, he dialed in his sight for the range at least 200 feet out. 
When he dialed in his sight, he aimed and bang. He said he shot the deer at least twice with a 308 Lapua butt. The deer never stood a chance, he said, but yet the deer still stood tall. So my grandfather, after a couple of seconds of thinking, I remembered this very vaguely, but he picked me up and ran as fast as he could. Once we got back to the cabin, he was out of breath going downstairs into the basement, picking up every single gun he owned, loading it and cocking it. It was just me, my grandfather, my dad, and my brother, in law at the time. We all held our guns up high, except for me with my tiny little 22 caliber thinking I would do some damage. We anxiously waited for this thing, this beast, to follow us into the cabin, but after 45 minutes of waiting, nothing happened. Later that day, around 7 a.m., we decided to pack our stuff and get the hell out of Dodge, but once we got back into the city, we were all very shaken up, and it was a very, very quiet ride home. I'm 32 now, but I remember my father telling me a story when I was 15, saying that Grandpa went out to the same exact woods and never came back we have never heard from or seen my grandfather ever again. Now I know what some of you are thinking, Oh, you guys just saw a deer and your grandfather overreacted, maybe, maybe. But it was very, very quiet. The air was very still. There was not a single sound to be heard, so we think possibly it might have been a Wendigo. But here's the thing. After my father told me the story when I was 15 years old, I've certainly heard some things outside my window. It's been very quiet at night at times as when I'm sitting outside having a cigarette, but maybe whatever was in those woods when I was 10 years old started to follow us back from Quebec and those woods. Why do I think this, you might ask? My dog Charlie has gone missing for two weeks now. He always, and I mean always, comes back when we whistle and call his name. There has been no dogs looking like Charlie at the pound. No one has seen a dog like Charlie. So we maybe think that something from those woods took Charlie. That's what my dad thinks. I personally think Charlie may have run away. So my question to you guys is what do you think might have been in those woods when I was 10 years old in Quebec? And did it follow us back? I've only been living here at Snow College for a couple months, but something strange is definitely happening here. For context, I am part Native American of the Lakota, Sioux tribe, and I'm trying to reconnect with that part of my heritage. As I have moved out, and away from my parents. I have always believed in the existence of skinwalkers, but the events that have transpired over the past couple of months have solidified it for me. At first, the occurrences started out small, hearing footsteps, growling in bushes, etc. But as the weeks have gone on, they have gotten to be bigger and bigger and bigger. It all came to a head Saturday night when I get a frantic text from a good friend of mine saying that he's messed up big time and scared shitless. Now this friend of mine is a very imposing dude, six feet two, around 280, and he grew up around Baltimore, so it takes a lot to scare him. So he's going through and telling me what happened and what he saw. A couple blocks away from the main campus, they're building a new temple, and this friend loves to walk around this area at night. According to him, just past the one street light on this road, he could see a massive dog pacing back and forth, east to west. He described it as a dog with the posture of a bear, toned build, obviously wild, but no discernible fur on it, like it was completely in silhouette. So, of course, I do some research and see the accounts of the Sherman family on their ranch and Gwen's description of a wolf dog she ran into sounds eerily similar to what my friend saw. What my friend neglects to tell me until we were out there again last night is that he was whistling on his walk. As we approached the spot where he saw it the night before, sitting under the streetlight, was the creature. It was exactly as he described it. Huge dog, posture of a bear, pointy ears, smoothest skin I've seen on a wild animal ever. We're both rightfully spooked, so we head back towards campus as we're walking past the humanities building. 
He tells me that it was around this spot where he was seeing shadow figures. He described them as having distinct human forms and hearing what sounded like a huge animal running at him. He came across a bald eagle feather in the middle of the sidewalk. There haven't been any bald eagle sightings in Ephraim, from what I know. We hung out on campus for a while after our encounter by the temple grounds, and we both were able to come to the conclusion that there was almost like a line across campus that the sightings would stop. Against my better judgment, I'm planning on going out there again later tonight to see if I could maybe get any pictures of this thing for concrete evidence that we both saw something, and that it wasn't just our nerves getting to us. We located a trail in the snow that went from the road down an embankment, through the creek, up another embankment to a lookout type spot where you could see the road but not be seen. Then the tracks went back down through the creek and back to the road about 20 feet from the start of the tracks. Also, we think someone was trying to lure it to the road because we found a banana peel in a tree and an apple on the side of road. Tracks looked to be a couple days old. I am currently living with my partner on an outback property in Australia. Our neighbors are across the road, pretty big driveways on both our properties though, but still close enough to see their house clearly and whatnot. There's cows in the paddocks that surround our property. We could go up and pet them if we wanted to. And there's sheep a couple paddocks over, but they're far enough from the property that they're like white dots in my vision. You never hear the sheep, only the cows. We have our Christmas lights set up now, and they have timers set so that they're on from like 7 p.m. or 8 p.m. to 12 a.m. From the room we're staying in, they wrap around the whole veranda facing the neighbor's house. We can see the lights through our two windows, and I really like to have the blinds up at night because of this. Anyways, at around 10 p.m., my partner and I were settling down for sleep in our room, he notices that the cows are making noises like the sheep, and we joked about this for a bit. He even joked that it could be a skinwalker. I, however, did not find that funny, because I've heard that even talking about it, let alone joking about it, could attract them. I'm a believer, so I was getting bad vibes after he said that. He falls asleep, and I'm just watching videos on my phone and playing games. Occasionally I'll hear the same sheep noises. They genuinely sounded like actual sheep so I was pretty freaked out. Christmas lights made me feel protected, at least a tiny bit protected, because I felt like they'd be sensitive to the light and wouldn't want to be too close to it. That being said, I also felt like a deer in headlights. I genuinely felt like I was being watched, like it was a strong vibe, but I still tried to ignore it. 12 a.m. hits, and I don't realize this until the Christmas lights suddenly turn off. Now, I don't know if they make a noise like someone flipping a switch when they do this or not. I was asleep each time it's turned on and off before this moment. But that's exactly what it sounded like. I'm literally frozen in bed. And I'm tearing up a bit telling the story. And all I can think is that something went ahead and took the liberty to turn those lights off and the switch for those being maybe five steps away from one of the windows in our room. Every now and then, from 10 p.m. onwards, I've heard the occasional sheep, which is almost physically impossible given how far away they are. These noises sounded like they were coming from the cow paddocks, and the fact I'm hearing it now in the pitch darkness of my room, feeling like I'm being watched and hearing the additional strange sound outside every now and then, like something on the veranda or something moving outside. I'm spiraling, dude. So me being me, I decide of it I am terrified of the dark, and I am hyperfixating on these noises and shit. Let's put the TV on, listen to some sleep music or something, you know. Dumbest idea, I turn the TV on. It lights up. I go on YouTube and put on some bus and sleep music. I go from hearing like one sheep every now and then to hearing several. Clear as Emmeth day, these noises were definitely sheep, not to mention the strange noises outside were now becoming more frequent. Also, a cow starts screaming. 
Now they've done this before almost every night, actually. Usually it's like a build-up, almost like a moaning scream that slowly gets louder. It's like repetitive, like, oh, not just, oh. I don't know, bro, but last night it went from hearing several sheep to hearing a cow suddenly start doing the screaming with absolutely no build-up. There was genuine desperation or something in this noise, and it didn't last as long as they usually do. Truthfully, it's like ten seconds or something. This was like four or five seconds. I start watching shit on my phone, ignoring any and every noise outside, trying not to break down from absolute fear until I just about pass out. I wake up in the morning, not a single sheep noise, no loose sheep in the paddocks around the house, but I'm too scared to check the lights had been tampered with, and I'm too scared to see if there's a dead cow or some shit. I wanted to get any form of answers. I can hear. Keep in mind this shit has never happened before. We only ever hear cows and only cows. I know there's not much happening in this story, but I've never had any type of experience like this. I was fishing the creek, and I waited in the creek to get past the willow thicket. When I got back in the open, the hair on the back of my neck stood up, and I stopped and looked around. I spotted a large, blackish, brown thing in the creek. I thought it was a bear, till it looked up and I saw its face. I stood still and waiting to see what would happen. Then thing looked back down. Then to my left front a loud screaming grunt and the sound of limbs breaking scared the shit out of me. The thing in the water stood up and started to walk away, grunting and howling as it went. There was the smell of rotten eggs and shit in the air. The thing I saw was about six feet, five to seven feet tall and walked upright. The arms were huge and longer than normal. On the last day of our vacation, we were driving to dinner when my dad saw strange, about 14-inch tracks on the side of the road. The next day, we were driving to the airport when all of us saw the strange tracks, and there was about 50 to 100 yards of them. We saw the Bigfoot tracks in kind of brown dirt and sand. They were about 14 inches and at least four feet apart. There was about a 100-yard trail of tracks. Thanks for listening. Don't forget to hit that like button and subscribe. See you tomorrow.